Well, good morning, beloved church family. Good morning to everyone. That means family, friends, nursing facilities, and their staff, and especially the first-time visitors. Stephanie and I are so excited to welcome each of you to be a part of Walking Worthy Ministry. It is our mission to share the Word of God and to connect with God as we grow in community and in His knowledge. We pray that through this service we can go, go and make a difference. And we pray that you will experience passionate worship, inspirational messages, and real life change. So thank you for coming today, and God bless you all. Let us get started with our weekly nursing facility roll call, where we shout out the facilities and their staff and acknowledge them and let them know that we are family, we are praying, and we do love them. In National City, we want to say hello to our family at Castle Manor Nursing and Rehab Facility. At Friendship Manor Nursing and Rehab Facility. And across town, Windsor Gardens Convalescent Center. We want to say hello to all of our family there. In Chula Vista, we want to say hello to our family at Frederica Manor Assisted Living and Senior Retirement Community and our family at the Canterbury Court Senior Living. In Bonita, California, we want to say hello to our family at Sunrise Senior Living and down at the water in Imperial Beach, we want to say hello to our family at Sun and Sea Manor for Alzheimer's and dementia. That's the facility for Alzheimer's and dementia. And we want to say hello to our family at our home church, Ocean View Church. That's our home church under the lead pastor, Steve Boshin. And we want to say hello to the staff and OVC Senior Adult Class, the Summit Seniors. So God bless you all. So moving right along, let us get to birthdays. For the month of November, we want to say happy birthday. God bless you. Special happy birthdays to my daughters, Krenisha Wesley, 1125, and Emilia Bryant, eleven. 25 and also yours truly Carlos 1122 the verse of the day that we want to give you comes out of Mark chapter 1 verse 15 which says the time has come he said the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe the good news. Let us get started with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Father in heaven, we bless your holy name. Bless us, your children, as we gather today to exalt you. We reject evil plots and all sin in your name. And we pray for your grace so that we may accomplish good works in your name. Lord, fill us with your glory and power and open the floodgates of heaven and give each of us your reign of blessings. Let us be refreshed through you as we look forward to fellowship with you and each other. Bless our enthusiasm today because it is our opportunity to know and to serve you better. We thank you, Lord, for always being there for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. In the book of Psalm, chapter 28, verse 7, 
It says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and my song, I praise him. This classic favorite hymn reminds us that our Father is waiting for us all in heaven. Also in the book of John chapter 14 verse 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You see, as Christians in our hearts, we ought to be filled full of joy as we think about heaven. And and do not need to fear death. Our hearts are to jump with happiness because we will begin a wonderful new life with Jesus Christ. He has prepared a place for each one of us. So join Stephanie and I as we sing Sweet By and By. Get ready. John chapter 15, verse 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. And in Romans 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Join Stephanie and I as we sing Amazing Love. You are my king. Get ready. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven, because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. Because you died 
Special for you, entitled All Things New. And this song exemplifies what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. About learning to trust in that relationship once you have modeled one with Him. It's about knowing on this side of the cross, this side of heaven, where you are destined for. With every breath of praise, we as Christians, we're to trust God and know that we are citizens of his kingdom. And this song is about during the course of a loss in that moment, when you really believe heaven, the kingdom, seems so much closer and in the middle of what we all go through and what we have all been through during this pandemic this song has taken on another meaning. You see, it is a declaration of a new day. God calls, God makes all things new. Yes, he does. We must understand what Jesus Christ has done for us at Calvary. The brokenness of our lives is not the final defining legacy. You see, our brokenness is an incredible example 
to let the work and the light of Jesus to shine in our lives. That even in the darkest moments, the harshest situations, we as believers can say in faith, from the ashes, from the dust, I will rise again because of Jesus who makes all things new. I wanted to sing for you today, all things new. broken and make it whole again well here's the pieces of my heart what can you do with them cause I can't hold them all together anymore so I let them fall surrendered to the floor you may go your mercy and your love. 
Only you can do that, God. Only you. Thank you for making all things new. Today, I wanted to discuss what does it mean to be a citizen of God's kingdom? As a citizen of a country, you are granted certain rights. For example, you have the right to vote. You have the right to work. And you have the right to pay taxes, even though that is a right I would gladly give up if I could, and probably you would too. Regardless of where you live or grow up, if you belong to God, you are not just a citizen of your country. You are also a citizen of the kingdom of God. Because many people do not live under kingdom rule, you may not truly understand what kingdom means and specifically the kingdom of God. However, because you are a citizen of God's kingdom, there is an advantage and a responsibility that goes along with it. So let us make sure that we know exactly what this means. Let's, let's look at what it means. What is the kingdom of God? A kingdom is simply a territory that is ruled by a king. Therefore, the kingdom of God is a territory that is ruled and controlled by God himself. And when we think of kingdoms, we often think of physical territory. But you cannot apply that ideology to the kingdom of God because it goes beyond that. In our present state, the kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom. It is a spiritual one. It is not about land or territory. It begins in the heart of a person. God is not interested in taking physical territory. Not at all. He doesn't have to because he already owns it all. However, this is not true of a person's heart because God does not automatically rule there, the heart. When God is looking to establish his kingdom in the earth, he does this in the hearts of men and women. You see, he works from the inside out. Some people mistakenly believe that God wants to take over the political system, the media, or every other worldly system to promote his agenda. What God really wants is to take over the reign in a person's heart. Because when he does that, when he takes over the reign of a person's heart, everything else will follow. So how do you gain access to the kingdom of God? Because the knowledge of God begins in the heart, there is only one way to gain access to the kingdom. There must be a change in your heart. There must be some surgery done, a heart transplant, a heart transplant. Here is how Jesus puts it in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Unless you are born again, you will have no access to the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that begins when you are born again and you surrender lordship to God in your heart. Eventually, there will be a physical kingdom of God that we will see. But that will not happen until after Jesus Christ returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. Until then, the kingdom of God lives in your heart. So what does it mean to be a citizen 
of God's kingdom. There are many benefits that come from being a citizen of God's kingdom. And I would like to highlight four, four things that mark you as a citizen of God's kingdom. First, as a citizen, you are under God's lordship. Remember that you're under God's lordship. The kingdom of God is not one that is entered into by force. You can't force your way in the kingdom of God. It is by choice. God could force you to surrender, but he doesn't. You must choose to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. This means that you willingly live your life by his commands and guide your life by the constitution of God's kingdom, which is the word of God. As a kingdom citizen, you align with God's lordship by aligning your life with what God has said in his word, in his holy word. When you choose to make him Lord and King, then you give him the right to have the final authority over every decision and every choice that you make in your life. If you don't live in this fashion, then you're not truly living under the, his kingdom authority. When there is real kingdom authority, you lay aside all your opinions to follow what the king desires. In other words, you, you do not debate with the king, but you serve at his pleasure. What he says is what you do. But again, this is not by force. It is by choice. God is the only king that gives you the freedom to choose whether you will submit to his lordship. However, if you're going to be a citizen of the of his kingdom, you must choose to surrender. In Matthew 16, verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Number two. As a citizen, you are under God's protection. There was his lordship, now it's his protection. The good part of being a citizen of God's kingdom is that you live under God's protection. Look what it says in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. If you belong to him, you are safe. And no one will ever snatch you out of his hand. This means that in Christ, your position in the kingdom is secure and no one can remove, remove you from that position. This does not mean that you won't face hardships or pain in this life because God has not set up his physical kingdom in the earth yet. However, you can be confident knowing that as a citizen of God's kingdom, your salvation is is safe and protected in Jesus Christ. Number three, as a citizen, you are under God's provision. We had lordship, protection, now provision. If you are a citizen of God's kingdom, this also means that the king is responsible for your provision. Because you are surrendered to his lordship, that means you can gain access to his resources. His resources. Since you belong to him, 
He will use his resources to take care of you. The best part is you don't even have to worry about it. So don't worry. Saying in Matthew 6 verses 31 through 33. So don't worry. Saying what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. As a kingdom citizen, our responsibility is to surrender to his lordship. When you do, he has promised to make every provision for you. What a promise. Fourth, as a citizen, you surrender to God's purpose. Lordship, protection, provision, purpose. Probably one of the most important aspects of being a citizen of God's kingdom as, is that you must surrender to his purpose. Here is how Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Surrender to God's lordship means surrender to his will and his agenda. Undoubtedly, this has become a struggle for many people because we have become confused as to what God's agenda is. We have mixed it all up with our own selfish motives or other ideas that don't come from God's word. If you want to know God's agenda, you must return to the Constitution, God's Constitution, which is the Bible. While there are many, while there are some very specific things that God will want you to do in accomplishing his will, this is part of of his specific plan for your life. And there are some things that we know are part of his desire for all kingdom citizens. I could write much more on this, but just let me simply give you four parts of God's agenda for you. There's preaching, there's teaching, there's praying, and there's obeying. Those are the four parts. Preaching, teaching, praying, and obeying. Preaching is to get the message of the gospel out. Get it out to the whole world. Teaching it means that we are to make disciples. Praying means that we are to build our relationship with the King, our Heavenly Father. And obeying means that we are to shine the light. Who's the light? Jesus. And to point others to him. I know that I could go more in depth, but generally, generally speaking, this is what kingdom citizens should be doing. These four things are, the, are at the heart of God's purpose and his agenda in the earth. Anything else? And we get sidetracked into other areas that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. If you are a citizen of God's kingdom, you should be sharing the gospel. You should be making disciples. You should be praying constantly and doing what God asks you to do. You do these things not because you want to accomplish your will on earth, but you do these things because you want to accomplish God's will on earth, which should be the desire of every kingdom citizen. There's something within all of us, that's Jesus' spirit, and that desires to be part of something more than what we can accomplish on our own, and that's the kingdom. We long to be noticed. We long to be listened to. We long to be known. We long to be understood. 
and we have our identity, the way we see ourselves. This is affected by all these things. Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, refers to the reign and the rule of the Father that was inaugurated in Jesus Christ and will be completely realized once God triumphs over Satan once and for all. Listen, but in the meantime, we as the church, who's the church? We're the church. We live between Jesus' first coming to earth and his next. And we live primarily not as Americans, not as Britons, not as Australians, not as Mexicans, not as Indians, not as any other nation, but we live as citizens of the kingdom of God. This is our new identity, the identity that supersedes all other as the ultimate reality of our existence. It is through this lens that we learn to see our lives and see the world in which we live. As Stephanie and I close, in the book of 1 John chapter 5, 11 and 12, this is what it says. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This passage of Scripture, so easy to understand, tells us that God has given us, given us freely eternal life, and that this life is in his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, the way to possess eternal life is to possess God's Son. The question is, how can a person have the Son of God? <clears throat> Man's problem is his separation from God. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 2, it says, But your sinful acts have alienated you from God. Your sins have caused him to reject you and not listen to your prayers. In other words, our sins separate us from God, who is perfect holiness. He is righteousness and justice. And God must therefore judge sinful man. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, You are too just to tolerate evil. You are unable to condone wrongdoing. You see, no amount of human goodness is as good as God. God is perfect righteousness. So because of this, Habakkuk 1.13 tells us that God cannot have fellowship with anyone who, who does not have perfect righteousness. In order to be accepted by God, we must be as good as God is. Before God we stand, naked, helpless, and hopeless in ourselves. No amount of good living will get us to heaven, and no amount of good living will give us eternal life. So here's God's solution. God is not only perfect in holiness, which I explained to you, but he is also perfect in love, and he is full of grace and mercy. Look what it says in Romans 5 eight. God demonstrates his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the good news of the Bible, the message of the gospel, the gift. God's own son lived sinless, and he died for us as our substitute. And in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21, it is written, 
God made the one who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we, we would become the righteousness of God. Just receive God's son. You must receive God's son. Because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, the Bible states, he that has the son has life. Receive the son, Jesus, as your savior by personal faith. Trust in the person of Jesus Christ and his death for our sins. In John chapter 1 verse 12, this is what it says. But all who have received him, those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become God's children. And in John 3, 16 through 18, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And that name is Jesus Christ. You can call on that name right now as we pray the salvation prayer and ask him to come into your, your heart, into your life. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for your love for me and for the plan of salvation through giving up Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, to die for my sins. I accept that I am a sinner and that Jesus took my place on the cross of Calvary to pay the full price for my sins and iniquities. The Bible says that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you, God, raised him from the dead, I will be saved. Hallelujah. I do believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of my life. And as I confess all my wrongdoings and ask for forgiveness, allow me to follow you for the rest of my days. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Woo. If you pray this prayer of salvation, Stephanie and I are so glad to tell you that you are now born again. That you are a new creation. The old things are passed away and all things are now new. God makes all things new. Amen. You are as new as one who never committed any sin. It is amazing to know that God doesn't remember any of our sins anymore. It's amazing. So now as a new creation, don't allow the devil to bring condemnation on you anymore. You are now in Jesus and Jesus has set you free. And if you're free in Jesus, you're free indeed. So Stephanie and I want to say congratulations with all the saints and the heavenly hosts. We want to say welcome to the family of God. Welcome. Last week's word was faithful. This week's word is preserver. Preserver. You see, God is a life preserver. Listen, four people are drowning and they're given a life preserver. Listen closely. The first one looks at it and he says, I don't believe it is a life preserver and I don't believe it can save me. 
he drowns. The second person says, I believe it is a life preserver, but I don't believe it can save me. He drowns. The third person says, I believe it is a life preserver, and I believe it can save me. But he never, never grabs hold. He drowns. The fourth and the last person says, I believe it is a life preserver, and I believe it can save me. He grabs hold. He lives. You see, the life preserver is the gospel in the form of Jesus Christ. Grab a hold of him, please, and live. The water is the judgment of God for sins, and that equals death. In our final thoughts, Stephanie and I want to let you know, beloved, we wish to share with you that there are way more benefits to being part of God's kingdom. But here is the last thought. If you're part of his kingdom, then you will inherit eternal life because his kingdom, it lasts forever and ever. And when we think about it, maybe this is the greatest benefit of knowing that you will spend eternity in the presence of the King of Kings. This is the greatest benefit. And you will get to enjoy the benefits of His kingdom forever, eternal. This is the ultimate, the ultimate reward of being a citizen of God's kingdom. And what an awesome reward it truly is. So until we meet again next week, Stephanie and I want you to remember to be safe, be kind to one another, and remember, Jesus is Lord.